the Middle East, the Holy Land, Israel, the West Bank. Why is it always on the brink? This is the way photographer Andy Larson sees the world. He's traveled all over it, living in half a dozen nations, taking pictures, some finding their way onto the pages of National Geographic. But Larson brings something besides a digital camera when he shoots. He brings his faith as an ordained minister. Larson uses his photography to answer a call and to bridge the gaps between peoples, specifically Muslims and Christians. But is peace even remotely possible in places like the West Bank and Israel? Armed only with that camera and his faith, this is the story of what he brought back. I uh, grew up here uh, from the Pacific Northwest, spent a lot of time in the hills here. It's hard not to like this place. Andy Larson is a Seattle area pastor and photographer. Well, I think part of it is, you know, the trees, they don't argue with you. <laughs> Larson lives in the land of tall trees, high tech, yeah. and flying fish. He's on a mission that began on a September morning when terror brought down the fragile understanding this country had of Muslims. Larson was a pastor. That day was the start of what would become a calling for Andy Larson to build bridges of understanding between Christians and Muslims. As I began to discover the gulf between us and them, between Christians and Muslims, I felt called to the place where, for many, the gulf seems to be the widest, Jerusalem and the West Bank, or the place many people would identify as Palestine. I took my first trip to the region in 2007, just curious, wanting to look and see and experience what life was there, what pe many people were talking about. Returned in 2009 for a very important conference in leadership. And then finally in 2011, went uh, for three months and lived in the city of Hebron, uh, doing all kinds of work, uh, photographing people, teaching English in the Cordova school to Palestinian children, and learning firsthand what was going on and, and meeting people. I kept bumping into people who were really quite good and decent and not what often is portrayed in the news. And these people were tenacious, they were lovely people, and they really yearned for peace. They really yearned for a better situation. Soon he went back and then returned again, and again, and again. Each time taking more pictures, making more friends, narrowing that gulf, building more bridges. But then came 2014 and the killing of three Israeli youths that led to the bombardment of Gaza and missile strikes against Israel. Before a fragile peace agreement was signed, 66 Israeli soldiers and five Israeli civilians were dead. On the other side, 2,300 Palestinians died. The United Nations says seven out of 10 of those were civilians. Here in the Holy Land, there's enough heat to last a lifetime. So how does a lasting peace break out? And where do you find it? Well, first you have to be the kind of person who looks for peace. So Andy Larson decided to go back and see how wide that gulf still was. Would peace still be possible? He was about to find out. It's starting, John. We're on the way. After three flights and 20 hours in the air with my photographer and producer, John Yeager, we finally landed in Tel Aviv. At an airport, Palestinians had targeted with missiles only weeks before. In only a short hour, our trek from Tel Aviv, from the airport to Jerusalem, would bring us into the epicenter of what was happening and the tension, really, of the weeks prior to our trip to this area. There 
is a lot of checkpoints surrounding our Jerusalem. There is many settlements and colonies. My friend Nihad owns the educational bookshop in predominantly Muslim East Jerusalem. Let me use this word, colonies. They are really good. They are colonies. Mm. Uh, they are surrounding all over the Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. and they are really uh, like uh, killing Jerusalem. I reminded Nihad of an expression I had learned three years ago when I was serving in Hebron. The phrase is Saber Tayyab. Which means uh, patient. The patient is good. Yeah. That we should learn the patient yes. because we need it actually here. Mm -hmm. You should have the patient at the checkpoint. <laughs> you should have the patient uh, everywhere. Yeah, we're uh, right at the entry to the Damascus Gate. The Damascus Gate is the entry to the Muslim quarter of the old city of Jerusalem. Uh, today is Monday. Last Friday, they blocked the Damascus Gate here. Um, since this is the, the, the route that most Muslims would take to the Temple Mount for prayer or the Al-Aqsa Mosque for prayer, they closed it down, I think, m mostly because of the tensions in the last few weeks here in, in, on the Temple Mount, but also in this area. But this is really the hub of most of the Arab quarter and the Palestinian section, the Muslim quarter of, of Old Jerusalem. You can feel it in the shops. You know, they're, they're, they're patient people, but you know, there's stuff that's percolating under the surface all the time. In 2007, my first trip to Jerusalem, we were walking a group of four of us down the Via Dolorosa, and we met a hostel, well, actually a hostel shop owner shouted at us, um, a Palestinian man, and uh, he, was, he was disturbed that we didn't enter his store. So uh, a few feet away from that experience, I felt prompted to go back and to talk to him. So we went back and within five minutes, we were in his store in the shop. Within 10 minutes, he was serving his tea. And I think he felt heard. I think it was important that we listen. On this day in Jerusalem, we observed no immediate hostility, just caution when I asked an Israeli soldier how quiet it's been today. I don't want to open my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a quiet, fine, yeah. Yeah. Where are you from? We're from no, Seattle. 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 Yeah. Seattle. I lived not, not a short time in Victoria, very close to Seattle. Yeah. Curiously, the soldier wouldn't tell us his name, only that he'd left Victoria, British Columbia, a few years ago to come back to Israel and serve in the army. He told us something we both knew well, that Jerusalem was a melting pot. This, absolutely, yeah. From Nigeria to Alaska to uh, Germany, everybody's meeting on this corner. It's a fascinating, yeah. fascinating place. <laughs> Every day. What he didn't tell us was how much that melting pot was just about to boil over. The next day I would grab the local bus number 21 into the West Bank, crossing the Green Line right into Bethlehem. Here I would begin to see the wall. It's not a charter that the tourists take to see the Holy Land that really seek to avoid seeing the wall. I came here to meet a minister and a professor of theology. My name is uh, Mundur Ishaq. I am a Palestinian Christian from uh, the Bethlehem area, from Beit Sahur, mm. and I uh, teach Biblical Studies Theology at Bethlehem Bible College. I am a Palestinian Christian. Uh, my family um, has been living in this region for at least 400 years uh, from an Arab origin. I just finished my uh, PhD uh, at the Oxford Center for Mission Studies, and uh, the theme of my study was uh, a Biblical Theology of the Promised Land. For us as Palestinian, uh, the theology of the Promised Land is a very important and, and uh, even personal topic, even a very controversial topic, because um, I grew up having to listen and respond to a theology uh, that came to us uh, mainly from uh, Western Christians uh, who told us that uh, God is giving our land to uh, the Jewish people who, because of the reality of the conflict, are my enemies. I even still remember reading stories about uh, David uh, and, and Goliath in the Bible and David having victory over the people of this land and, and being really uh, uh, not feeling at ease with reading these stories mm. because 
uh, in my mind, I related David with uh, Israel of today, the occupation, and uh, Goliath and his people with the Palestinians of today. And he knows that bridges are hard to build when checkpoints between Jerusalem and the nearby Palestinian towns like Bethlehem in the West Bank provide a daily frustration. And very often uh, soldiers would humiliate you uh, just to show you they are in control. Uh, very often they will just delay you for no reason. How does Munther deal with this? I've always been inspired by Martin Luther King. His insistence that evil will not drive out evil, but only love and, and light will drive out darkness and, and hate. According to Munther, there is more that unites us than divides us. Before I leave, Munther volunteers to recite the Lord's Prayer in Arabic. That night I take bus 21 back to Jerusalem and when the bus stops at the checkpoint right at the wall I'm reminded of Munther's words when all the Palestinian passengers have to get off and get searched before they can get back on. All I have to do is show my ID and smile at the officer. The next day I return to the West Bank again to look for peace at the Parent Circle, a joint Palestinian-Israeli organization of more than 600 families, all of whom have lost a close family member as a result of the prolonged conflict here. My name is Mazen Faraj. I'm from the Hesha refugee camp in Bethlehem. I'm almost uh, 40 years old. I'm married. I have three daughters. Majin's mother died when he was a child. He was a young adult when his father was shot and killed by Israeli troops. It's a long process, complicated, hard one, difficult, because they create that this tragedy, tragedy creates something new inside yourself. What is right? What is wrong? What's the black and white? Everything you can see it like this is darkness. There is no light. Majin says it's more than just a simple matter of forgiveness. It doesn't matter that if you are Israeli or Palestinian or Jordanian or Jewish or Christian or Muslims. We all suffer. We are, all of us, we are a human being. The, the tears is the same. And the pain is the same. And the feeling is the same. And the bereavement is the same. And he says revenge does not work. If someone kill your father or your daughter or your son, you kill back and you try to be more violent. But I never thought about revenge because our case as a Palestinian, it's about justice, it's about freedom. It's not about killing and violence. <laughs> Here we are today in the old city of Jerusalem and it's been tense these last few days. Um, and even for us today, we wanted to reach the Temple Mount to do some taping. And we came in and they says, oh, you can't, you can't go in there today. So the context is uh, the last few days, there's been a conservative rabbi who has gone up to the Temple Mount and said, this is ours. And even threatening or trying to mobilize a group of people so that they could build, build, rebuild the temple there. And today at 11 o'clock, 11.30, when the Muslims come to prayer, that would be a very uh, contentious or potential flashpoint. So they closed the Temple Mount, that section there where you see the dome of the rock. They closed it to tourists, to anybody, anybody coming in. And this thing, we tried, they said we could come in, but not with this, not with the mic. So we were turned back just because of that. But, uh, this, these are interesting days, and this is very, uh, very controlled and managed real estate. That evening, I'm asked to speak to an American church group touring the Holy Lands. They wanted to know why I was here. 
I've been a pastor also. So I was a pastor in the U.S. for, for about seven years. And in, um, in that period of being a pastor, 9-11 occurred. And, and something really um, traumatic kind of happened just in my soul in terms of the sense of call and what God wanted me to do. And that was into um, engaging Muslims. And I didn't know what that was going to look like, what that would, what that would, you know, what kind of shape that would take. But what I began to do, and I was still pastoring, was uh, build relationships with Muslims, and um, so I began to see them um, in a different way, not as a as a target or as an object of the gospel, but as someone that Jesus was calling me to engage. There was there was some tremendous things there that I learned just in that process, and continue to learn. I visit the mosque a lot uh, on Fridays, um, have many uh, really deep friendships in, in the mosque, and have become to be trusted in the mosque as, as a follower of Jesus. One of the things that Muslims have told me is that there's something unique about the Jesus that you live with us, and as they come to understand parts of that, they tell me what is unique. They said, well, you, wait a minute. You're a Christian, and you care about the Palestinians? Question mark. Because in their experience and exposure with most Christians, uh, those didn't go together. This isn't gibberish. This is real serious stuff. The more I'm real and transparent with a Muslim, the more they're actually interested in what I believe and how I live, and the more they want to know. Those are all then I felt compelled to tell the group what was happening in the city while they were touring the holy sites, like the Sea of Galilee, north of Jerusalem. Well, on the Temple Mount, there was um, some writing. So I, I, I understand you guys saw what you thought was maybe fireworks. Yeah. That was uh, uh, bullets, actually. And then um, stun grenades. And then um, the light rail uh, system that is fairly new here, there was a uh, there was an incident there where someone plowed into a, a crowd of people and a few people were, were killed. You, you should know that because people back home will probably be curious if you were involved in that, if you're safe. The wall stands as an incredible uh, obstruction through the city and it becomes the tablet upon which many Palestinians write their angst Sometimes their laughter, definitely their sadness. Just to get an idea of, of kind of the extent of the wall, uh, here we are at a very important point in Bethlehem. We're a home by um, Claire Anastasis is really circumvented by the wall. And you can see here, it goes totally around the wall. Three sides of her home are surrounded by the wall. And the wall being really, I think it's 24 feet high. And we see here plenty of graffiti of people uh, talking about the impact of the wall in their lives, their testimony. And my good friend, uh, Mark Braverman, a, a Jewish friend, uh, has said that the wall keeps people out in some ways, but it also keeps people on the other side kind of imprisoned in their own fear. Any way you want to look at it, it's absolutely wrong. And there has been very little acknowledgement that that's the reality. We've all been living with this David and Goliath myth of having to protect Israel from the evil hordes of Palestinians who want to destroy them. And this feeds right into the dominant American and Western narrative of the clash of civilizations and needing to protect our freedom against, again, these people with this dark, violent religion who worship another god. All of that horrible, untrue, frankly racist ideology um, that needs to be deconstructed if we are to survive as a planet. So really a prison is supposed to be a security thing to keep certain elements out and uh, no doubt that has some impact but in another way, in a very deep profound way, it, it keeps people in. Claire Anastas knows all about the deep and profound. She's Palestinian, Greek Orthodox. She remembers the day well in 2003 when the wall went up almost overnight on three sides of her home. 
This was just a stone's throw away from Manger Square in Bethlehem, where tradition says that Jesus was born. Yes, they came with the big bulldozers and the children went to school in early morning and they came back, find themselves buried alive in a big tomb. Mm. It's not easy, it's like, like a stone on our chest and we are, are, we are not be able to breathe. But Claire has a gift shop inside and she has tremendous hope. Yeah, we hope, uh, and actually I designed a nativity scene with the removable wall because we still believe that nothing impossible to God, and he's going to demolish this world. A little further down the highway from Bethlehem, Dahar Nasser has no wall to obstruct his view. And this is here when the sun set, you can see the Mediterranean Sea from here. But Nasser, a Palestinian Christian, can also see Jewish settlements that literally surround his mountaintop home called the Tent of Nations. Each summer he invites people to come here from all over the world to camp and to help out in projects around the community. This hillside used to be filled with olive trees, he tells me. This is an olive, yeah. You have olive, you have grapes, you have apple, you have fig, yeah. And before in May coming, the, you know, the Israeli and destroy many trees here in the valley, yeah. Like more than 1,500 trees. But what you do, I have still hope. You want to continue and plant more double trees. Double yeah. trees? Yeah, yes. So you, yes, yeah. you want to plant more trees, yeah. double, double yes, than what yes, was yes. Uh, taken away? Yeah, yeah. because, because uh, before like uh, uh, 2001 coming, settlers uh, destroyed 250 trees, yeah. and I plant 500. <laughs> Nasser tells me his family has owned this hilltop for more than 100 years. He says it was deeded to the Nasser family by the Turks of the Ottoman Empire and then subsequently by the British. They've managed to survive on this hilltop with a tenacity much like the olive trees they cultivate, but also with a genuine love for their neighbors who want their land. They have one rule. You can come onto this property and visit, but you have to leave your weapon at the gate. This is, you know, a, a tent of nation, me people building bridges. And we have the stone here writing, we refuse to be enemy. But saying that and doing it in the conflict are two different things. I think one of the challenges is even in the notion of this being a conflict. When we hear the word conflict at the international level, we think of something like a border dispute between Peru and Ecuador maybe that's gonna to go to the International Court of Justice and resolve the, the border dispute. This isn't that. This isn't a conflict between two competing sides that have equal legitimacy. This is a rather classic case of an occupying power and an occupied population. We just came through uh, the checkpoint coming over into, into Israel from Bethlehem and the wall abuts right up to the city. So when we come around and cross over, uh, we can stay on the bus. Uh, but we come to the checkpoint, all the Palestinians have to get off the bus. Look at these tents. We, we noticed uh, on our way to the Damascus Gate that there's barricades, uh, high police and military uh, presence. Today, of course, is Friday, uh, and this is the time when uh, the Muslim communities, the Arabic, Arab communities come down to the Damascus Gate to go into prayer. So they're trying to control the crowds and keep everything under wraps. We were on our way to uh, the De Damascus Gate this morning to grab a taxi to Hebron and uh, there was uh, barricades. Uh, today is Friday, it's the day of prayer. And this place would be humming normally, this street right here, all the shops to my left would be open and there'd be massive people flowing. But the barricades are holding back people. So uh, people, uh, men 50 and older can get through. That's what they're allowing, but uh, the younger, younger folk, um, they can't pass. So 
it's a ghost town right now. But as I got deeper into the heart of the city, closer to the Al-Aqsa Mosque, the crowds began to build. I just picked up a Sahla beer. We're on the junction of Alwad Street and the Via Dolorosa, and people are flowing in for prayers. The last 100 yards of the uh, Alwad Street, we came to the junction of Via Dolorosa. The Christians went right up to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Muslims continued on down the street, and they're turning left into the Al-Aqsa. We tried to get through. Uh, they asked if we were Muslim, and we said no, of course, and so they wouldn't let us through. So. Just a few steps away, there was plenty of room at this t-shirt shop. The manager gave us his take on what was happening nearby. The, the Jewish people doesn't let the Muslim be free in the mosque and to okay. pray. This is what's happened. Sammy is 28. He manages his grandfather's t-shirt shop in Old Jerusalem. We are not free. You're not free? No, no, like a jail. They put the people like inside the jail. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Okay. Also, the West Bank, yeah, they went the big wall, they put them in the big jail. Mm -hmm. in Gaza is the same thing, you know, it's a yeah, big jail. The people, you know, like a bomb. Especially when Israeli troops trying to keep an orderly flow of Muslims into the Al-Aqsa Mosque restrict the flow too much. Muslims just trying to go to prayer cannot get through. Never be peace. We meet Daniel just down the block. He's an Israeli Jew from Tel Aviv. I think both sides have a long way to go. I think there's a sort of a sense in Israel that that we can't trust the Arabs on a peace agreement. And I think the Arabs have a sense of sort of, well, there's no chance anyway, so let's just go as crazy as we can. Before he got a tech job, Daniel served in the Israeli Defense Force, like everyone else. I think it's really important to remember yeah. that the Middle East is not America. And America is a very large, very powerful state that lives between two peaceful nations. And Israel is a state that's only 66 years old and has come from nothing to where it is today, a modern state. And lives be between nations, you know, it's neighboring countries are nations that have not developed so far. And in fact, lately have been moving towards Islamic extremism. I mean, but in America, you know, you turn on the television, you hear about ISIS. Right. Well, we live next to ISIS, you know what I mean? So it's important to take into proportion hmm. the situation here, yeah. that it's not America, and that our neighbors are not, you know, Mexico Peaceful. and uh, Canada. And he tells me that the future of the state of Israel is not really certain. And so to understand that when Israelis seem to react strongly, there's, there's reason for that. And he says before peace is possible, the environment has to change. It's my hope that it does. It's my yeah. hope that it does too. Yeah, yeah. We're here on the edge of the, the Jewish quarter that overlooks the, the floor here of uh, the, actually the exterior wall of the original temple, the Wailing Wall. And here there's groups that are planning to rebuild the temple. And they're just waiting. They've got materials, they've got plans, they've got uh, priests also in the robes that they would wear in, um, in their religious festivals in the imagined rebuilt third temple. Uh, this is sacred ground, very sacred ground. Uh, but it also happens to be sacred ground for Muslims um, and also for Christians. Yesterday, uh, the heads of the churches of Jerusalem, these, these would be different traditions in the Orthodox and Catholic um, um, streams within the Christian church, they appealed to both the Muslim sectors of the society and the, the Jewish sectors to allow calm to settle in here. And it, it seems to me that they're kind of in the middle between these, historically between these two religions, and today even um, are playing a role of being in the middle, being mediators, and appealing to both sides uh, to make peace and to allow access to this holy site for the religious festivals.
Isa is a Palestinian Catholic. He manages a hotel in Palestinian East Jerusalem, and he knows all about access. He got married nine years ago. He had family that only lived a few kilometers away. They could not attend the wedding because Palestinians cannot travel freely in and out of the West Bank. People usually, uh, when you tell them uh, these stories, they start laughing because they don't believe it. Uh, I was born and raised here. He says his family's home was confiscated a few years ago by the Israeli government. As a Palestinian, if you live outside uh, Israel for seven years, mm -hmm. then your ID is confiscated. Okay, so because I lived over seven years outside Israel, my ID is confiscated. Luckily, during my stay in the U.S., I became a citizen. So now I uh, apply for a visa on an annual basis. So I get a visa with work permit. Sahar Vardi was born and raised here too, but she is Jewish. The bottom line of the why is that we're afraid. We're a society that's completely um, full of fear. And part of it is historical and it's our own personal experiences and you know growing up everyone will talk about their grandparents and what is their story from the Holocaust um, and it's it, it's a very personal story for a lot of people and it's not just the Holocaust obviously our parents fought in the 67 or 73 war it's kind of we're, we're brought into this world in which everyone around us has some kind of trauma um, that has to do with with war with violence the, official education system in Israel, uh, parts of its goals, its written goals since 1951, have been preparation for military service. Right down to the way Israeli Jewish students are taught. It means that the way that we study math can be with examples about soldiers or guns. Uh, there's this worksheet that uh, was given to kindergarten students to teach them how to count. So you have the numbers from 1 to 10 on one side and then symbols on the other side and the kids are supposed to you know, connect the number 2 to 2 symbols. And the symbols that were used were tanks and airplanes. When Sahar was a teenager, she rebelled against that system and it cost her. Um, yes, I, together with a group of friends, when I was 17, just before military service, uh, wrote a letter to the Prime Minister, Minister of Defense, um, declaring that we're going to refuse our military service for political reasons because we oppose the occupation and we're not willing to be a part of the power implementing it. We had about 100 people who signed the, the letter that we sent, 10 of which were imprisoned as a result, um, including myself. In these pictures, Sahar Vardi is shown protecting a young Palestinian boy from an Israeli soldier in Jerusalem. She served three months in jail for refusing to serve in the military. Her brother, on the other hand, enlisted. Um, I bet you have some great discussions around the, the table at dinner sometimes. Definitely. It makes for interesting Friday night dinners. <laughs> There's a tendency to always say, well, it's a very complicated political issue. It's not that complicated. Jerusalem, as an example, is a city in which 40% don't have the right to vote. That's not a complicated argument. <laughs> you know, there's so much that you can just bring down to that. And then, and then you don't have to talk about, are we talking about Zionism or the right of Israel to exist? We're talking about civil rights. We're talking about something that, that you can understand very clearly, especially in an American context, what civil rights mean. Some, like Jewish author Josh Rubner, even go as far as saying America holds the key to peace in the Middle East. Well, clearly I think the major, major obstacle to a just and lasting resolution to the Israeli-Palestinian issue is our government's policies toward Israel, which fundamentally support and undergird Israel's oppression of the Palestinian people in terms of the nearly unlimited, unconditional military aid and diplomatic support that we provide to Israel, we are responsible for, and I would argue are actually complicit in, Israel's apartheid policies toward the Palestinian people, which is why I think it's so fundamentally important for us in the United States as people of uh, conscience to work to change our government's policies because in a very real sense what's standing in the way of a just and lasting peace between the parties is our government's policies. Our government perpetuates the mythology that this is a conflict where if we get both sides to the table 
Both sides have to make concessions. Neither side will get all they want. Both sides should change. There's no equality here. And to some, there's been enough talking. Yeah, my name is Mitri Rahib, and uh, I'm a senior pastor at Christmas Lutheran Church in Bethlehem. Dr. Raheb says the occupation continues because through sermons and theology, the American Christian Church allows a narrative to continue that fails to make a distinction between the Israel of the Bible and the Israel of today. This is why churches here, many are actually part of the problem, not part of the solution. I, th I believe that churches have the ability to be, in this country, to be peacemakers not peace talkers. You know, I distinguish between peacemaking and peace talking. Peace talking, we have so many. And I think Jesus really knew exactly uh, what he's saying when he said, blessed are the peacemakers, not the peace talkers. Because in Palestine for 20 plus years, uh, Palestinians and Israeli have been doing peace talks and the situation got worse. So we need to do something. And I think churches in this country, they have the ability to do something, to do something in reality. And I encourage them to do exactly that. Alex Awad says his father was shot and killed by Jordanian troops and Jewish extremists, leaving his mother to raise seven children. Today, he's a pastor of the East Jerusalem Baptist Church. He also teaches at Bethlehem Bible College. It seems like peacemakers, whether in Israel or in the United States or around the world, uh, are becoming a rare thing. And uh, they are also ridiculed in the news media. They are uh, sometimes uh, imprisoned in some places. And uh, therefore, uh, I would say as long as uh, peacemakers are not being heard, we'll have less peace and we'll have more violence. Every day of my trip to Jerusalem, there was violence. I would lay on my bed at night and hear the concussion of gas canisters and gunfire. Felt like it was about to erupt almost on a daily basis. The riots last night kept this cabbie awake. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, this is the country all the time, all the time. No peace in this country, all the time. It's easy to give in to that feeling. Leila, who runs a woman's co-op in Hebron, doesn't think peace right now is possible either. To be honest, I am not think so in this time, no. But that doesn't mean she can't laugh at the little things. This is one of her biggest sellers. This woman can do anything, and men can do something. <laughs> this is, we did it, you know, we did this message just to, this is just a joke, yeah, but we did it just because the many shopkeepers here, they're against us. Ah. And we did it just to show them that you can. We are strong. If I he I feel I have my freedom, then what I want more? Yeah. I want nothing. Just I want to be free. Until then, she says, she just needs that word that Nihad first told us about ten days ago, saber tayeb, or patience. We are not terrorists, and right. we are human beings. Right. In the end, we are human beings. Just like us. Yes. Do you have a good teacher? Yani ukula kani da kamal mukwaisi. Shuan bi. Yani mal mal da kamal mukwaisi. Yes. In the ten days in Jerusalem and the West Bank, I continue to meet incredible people across the spectrum on all sides of the conflict. These people shared common traits. They were generous. They were kind. They were warm with their hospitality and food. But above all, they were tenacious for peace, working in the daily grind. And it's these people, these people that give me hope. So as Andrew Larson boarded a plane home from Tel Aviv, full of hope, the question still lingered. Was peace possible? I definitely think it's possible. Yeah. But not at the moment. 
as possible, Joseph? Yeah, I turn. So I hope so. I hope so to be beach in this country. I hope so. I think hope is found in uh, in, in in people who are serious in their efforts to build bridges and, and take Jesus' uh, commandments uh, and, and calling seriously. Are we seeking new initiatives? Are we building bridges? Are we really peacemakers? I think hope is found in, uh, in, in, in people who are serious in their efforts to build bridges and, and take Jesus' uh, commandments. Uh, and, and calling seriously. So there's two things is connected together, security and freedom. And there is no security for the Israelis without my freedom. And there is no freedom for the Brazilians without the security of Israelis. It's connected together. It is. If we agree or not, this is the truth. I mean, yes. There will be peace, um, or there will be an end to occupation. I don't know what peace means always, okay. but there will be an end to occupation. I have absolutely no doubt about it. Yes. I need people here to love each other. Yes. Yeah. If there wasn't hope, Andy Larson wouldn't keep going back to the Holy Land, whether it's on the brink or not. Perhaps it's because some people just find hope in those places where it's hardest to find. Or maybe yeah. hope just finds them. Peace. Peace. <laughs> <laughs> good. Very good.